My class, welcome back to electromagnetics. So, uh, but this lecture will conclude our examination of Maxwell's equations in the integral form. Uh, today we look at the last one, uh, which would be Gauss's law for magnetic fields. <clears throat> First, we're gonna look at a little historical background. Surely you can guess who this is probably before I even start. Uh, education, he went to the University of Helmstead uh, for his work. He worked at the University of Göttingen uh, in Germany. I'm not sure if I pronounced those right. Uh, here's a picture of him. It's a pretty familiar picture. Uh, anybody got a guess? Surely you've guessed by now. This is Carl Friedrich Gauss. He lived from 1776 uh, to 1855. Uh, some of the notable things uh, for Gauss he had two notable students, PhD students. Uh, one was Riemann. Riemann's probably uh, one of my favorite mathematicians. We'll cover some of uh, some information about him later. Um, an extraordinary mathematician. He set up a lot of the groundwork for Einstein's work. And then Kirchhoff. Hopefully uh, that's a familiar name to you as we have Kirchhoff's laws for circuit analysis <clears throat> with the the Kirchhoff loop and the Kirchhoff nodal analysis. Uh, he also worked with Wilhelm Weber, uh, developing much of the current knowledge in magnetism. Uh, he did so much in that field that two of the four equations of Maxwell's equations are named in his honor for his tremendous contribution. Uh, Gauss showed uh, extraordinary mathematical skills. Even from a, a, a young age, he was uh, a child prodigy, and he began exploration into uh, non-Euclidean geometry, which uh, that's where Riemann steps in. He did a lot of work in that field as well. Uh, that, that was what laid the groundwork for relativity. One quick story about Gauss as a child prodigy that uh, you may have heard or may not, but it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, when Gauss was still in primary school, one day his teacher uh, asked the class to add together all the numbers from 1 to 100. Some stories say that it was because Gauss was in trouble. He got asked to do it. Uh, but anyway, the teacher assumed that this task would occupy uh, the students for quite a while. Uh, the teacher was shocked, though, when Gauss, after just a few seconds of thought, uh, wrote down the answer of 5,050. So 5,050 is the sum of all the numbers from 1 to 100. 100. Uh, the teacher couldn't understand how his pupil had calculated the sum so quickly in his head, but the 8-year-old Gauss pointed out that the problem was actually quite simple. Uh, if you want, you can take a minute to see if you can figure out how he did this. It is, it is a rather simple approach once it's explained to you. Okay, assuming you want to know the answer, what he did was he added up the numbers in pairs, the first and the last, the second and the second to the last, and so on. He was able to observe that 1 plus 100 is 101, 2 plus 99 is 101, 3 plus 98 is 101, so on and so forth, and that there, since uh, there were 100 numbers, if you divide it by 2, there's 50, so there had to be 50 of these pairs totaled. So 50 times 101 it was simply 5,050. So that is a pretty clever way to dissect the problem, especially for an eight-year-old. So we'll be concluding part two with this lecture uh, as we wrap up uh, Maxwell's equations in integral form. Again, doing uh, Gauss's law uh, for magnetic fields. So the next equation uh, we'll look at, like we said, is Gauss's law for magnetic fields, which is expressed as this equation here. And so what this equation is telling us is that if we sum up the magnetic flux density over some closed surface, uh, that's what this is indicating, uh, then this should always equal to zero. So again, looking at a diagram here, if we have some enclosed volume by some surface, uh, S, and again, we're going to, this is a vector uh, quantity, so we'll have a, a vector normal to the surface all the way around. Uh, if we sum up this dot product uh, across this surface, it should always equal to zero. So in plain English, uh, what this equation is telling us 
is that the total magnetic flux emanating from a closed surface should always be zero. This is super important because in physical terms, this means that while electric charges do exist in the forms of electrons, magnetic charges do not exist. There's no way to contain a magnet magnetic charge in a volume. So that's why this side is always zero because they don't exist. So this law can be derived from Far Faraday's law, much like we did the previous one uh, with Ampere's law. So if we could again consider uh, the same type of diagram with two surfaces, S1 and S2, both uh, being uh, contained by this uh, path or circle or whatever you want to call it. So like we said before, it's like you're blowing bubbles out of both ends of this uh, opening here. And so they're bounded by C. And then again, we have our uh, area vectors. They're all normal to the surface all the way around. So if we examine these surfaces and apply Faraday's law to both sides, we have that the uh, integral around uh, the path, the closed path of the uh, E field dotted with DL, this should be equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux density across the surface. So we've got that for surface one. Uh, the same thing, exact same quantity here should be equal to the same a time derivative of the integral of across surface two. So if we now combine these two equations, uh, much like before, uh, we'll have the results that the sum of the magnetic flux, the, the time derivative of the magnetic flux density over surface one should equal the time derivative over uh, surface two of the magnetic flux. And so when we combine these two together, uh, with the, which just combines the limits of integration, uh, we see that this should be equal to zero. So it should be equal to some uh, constant in relation to time. And again, just as before, there's no experimental evidence to suggest that the right side of this equation should be any non-zero value. So this yields the final equation that the integral across the entire surface of the magnetic flux density should equal to zero. And this is Gauss's law uh, in integral form for a magnetic field. So let's review Maxwell's equations. First, we have Faraday's law. Remember, Faraday's law told us that if we integrate the E field along a closed uh, path or contour, that this should equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux density uh, across a surface bounded by this contour. Uh, similarly, uh, Ampere's law tells us that if we integrate the uh, magnetic field intensity along some uh, contour, all the way or a closed contour, that this should equal to the total current uh, going through the surface uh, bounded by the contour plus the total uh, displaced current uh, on the same surface, the time derivative of that. Gauss's law for E fields uh, tells us that the displacement uh, vector uh, field vector uh, integrated over a surface which should equal to, and this is a closed surface, should equal to uh, the total charge contained in the volume created by that surface. And then Gauss's law for magnetic fields uh, tells us if we integrate all of the magnetic flux density over a closed surface that encloses some volume, that that should always equal to zero. So just to give the graphics again in review as we wrap up this uh, part of the course, again, Faraday's law, contour, surface enclosed by the contour, um, the E field integrated along this contour should equal to the magnetic, the time derivative of the magnetic flux density across this surface.
Likewise, Ampere's law again tells us that on this contour, if we integrate the magnetic field intensity all the way around, that that should equal to the total current traveling through this surface that's in, that is uh, enclosed by this contour plus the time derivative of the displacement current traveling through there as well. Again, again, I want to give these to you in plain English because I want you to start to understand what they're telling us here. So when we look at Ampere's law, uh, again in review, probably the best example of this is for the capacitor, which we talked about. So we have current traveling here. So if we use this first uh, contour, the, our first surface, excuse me, contained by this contour, it will be penetrated by the current. So therefore we would capture that in this term. There would be no displacement current. However, if we were to redraw the surface to where it goes through the center of the capacitor, we don't have any real current uh, flowing through there, but we do have, assuming that it's time variant, we will have some displacement current traveling across the capacitor, which will again translate back to actual current flow on the other side. So Ampere's law helps us to understand how and why a capacitor behaves the way it does. Gauss's law for E fields uh, again tells us if we have a surface that's enclosed to create a volume, that if we integrate the displacement vector, uh, the sum of the displacement vectors across this surface, normal to this surface, that it should equal to the charge contained inside the volume created by the surface. And finally, Gauss's law for M fields. Uh, this tells us that if we, again, if we have <clears throat> a surface that is enclosed to create a volume, that if we integrate and sum up all of the magnetic flux density that is normal to this surface creating the volume, that the if we do it across the entire surface, that it should uh, equal to zero. All that's going in should equal to what's coming out. So might benefit us now to try to put all this together just for a quick glimpse to see what's actually happening uh, with the electric and magnetic fields uh, whenever we have just a simple piece of wire carrying a time varying current and there's plenty of examples of this in your house or whatever building you're sitting in um, we receive AC current at all the outlets it's uh, time varying at 60 Hertz so uh, these fields are actually being uh, created all around you all the time but here's what it looks like so what we have here on the top view here is a, a wire and the current you see this i at t we're saying that it's traveling uh, up the page so when it's doing that when the current flows it's creating a magnetic field which are the arrows coming out and going in there and it's alternating so it alternates as we go out so if you look at this this is the the side view so now the wires coming in and out of the paper so you can see here's your H fields these circles which correspond to uh, these dots and X's up here and so in turn because we have this time varying magnetic field uh, Maxwell's equations tell us that it's going to create these complementary E fields so that's what you see these contours up here are the uh, electric fields that are being created by these magnetic fields. So it's kind of a, uh, an orchestrated uh, assembly or, or process. And so down here you see the E fields are the X's going into the paper and the dots coming out of the paper. So it's almost like a perpetual uh, situation as the current's flowing. And uh, you know, one one kind of contributes to the other. So you have all these fields being created. Now they drop off pretty quickly as you move away from the wire, because as we've seen, uh, they vary with one over R squared, uh, but they're still there for the most part. And so it's interesting to see how that all works. So again, Ampere's law says that anytime there's a time varying current through uh, a surface, it generates rings of magnetic force, which we can see right there. And Faraday's law, uh, 
tells us that when there's a time varying flux density, which we just demonstrated there is, this creates rings of electric force. So again, this is just summarizing uh, what I just said. You can, you can see for yourself.